Hello and welcome to this diabetes skills video focusing on behaviour change strategies to improve patient diabetes management. Please share your thoughts in the comments and make sure that you like and subscribe so that you don't miss any new content that we upload. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Hope Frost and on behalf of SDK Healthcare I'm delighted to welcome you to the third and final in this series of diabetes skills webinar. Today's session will focus on behaviour change strategies to improve patient diabetes management. Do hope that you find it useful and enjoyable. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Abbott for kindly sponsoring this webinar. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Sue Dad, consultant and co-vice chair of the Diabetes Primary Care Society. Hi Sue. I hope and thank you. Thank you for that introduction and a huge thank you again um, to yourselves for inviting me to chair this along with Kath who is presenting um, because, you know, third one, um, but these have been um, amazing um, and certainly to see so many attendees coming. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and as you've heard, I'm uh, here chairing this with Kath, who's going to be giving a presentation and then we tend to have a discussion. Um, Please, 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 these work incredibly well if you send through all of your questions to us, but equally your thoughts and some of the things that we're going to be taking you through this afternoon around uh, behaviour change strategies for our patients with diabetes and never has the time been more challenging for us um, as in the last year and looking forward this year coming too. So please do send through any thoughts, anything that you found useful and um, that you've used yourself so that we can then have a discussion around this. So I am going to be welcoming Kath now, um, who is going to be taking us through the first session. Um, and Kath, hi, hi Kath. So we have been, as, as you know, this is our third one of these. Kath, for those of you who haven't joined us before, by background is a nurse working in mental health nursing, but has also over the last decade, just over a decade, been working with many sectors, including the health sector, looking and helping teams with change management, primarily conversations, how to have conversations. And so is just perfectly placed to take us through this session. So welcome, Kath, and I will Thanks, disappear. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I will come back every time you call on me throughout this session. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing the session with you today. And um, again, it's a Wednesday, but not a wet Wednesday. So thanks very much for joining. Um, Sue made a really good point. I just want to pick up on that. She said, you know, never has this time been more challenging. Well, we had some really sad statistics yesterday, didn't we? So we hit the 100,000 mark for deaths from COVID. But there was also something that was reported that I was really interested in and, I, you know, and shocked by, which, which said yesterday in The Spectator that um, one in five death certificates from people with COVID are listing diabetes as a comorbidity. So that's, you know, probably not a surprise to you, but, but quite a shock at how much it's been featured in this awful pandemic. And secondly, they're now saying that, you know, why has um, so many people died in Britain? Why is it spreading so quickly? And they're now saying that two key features, contributory features might be a uh, number of diabetics and obesity. So it really is um, a time of challenge, as Sue said, and a time where we really need to be finding ways to um, engage people. Sorry, so can you see that? I'm just going to move this out of the way. Right, so yes, we've got what I hope will be an interactive session with you all. Um, I've got a couple of videos because I know that people have said they're visual learners, but I'm hoping they'll really give you a sense of different ways we can engage with patients, particularly around behaviour change in health, which we know is difficult. So um, as ever, I'm going to take you on to just have a look at what are the objectives that we want from today. So I want to talk through some practical strategies and tips around these difficult conversations, particularly when you're trying to engage people who are reluctant. We're going to be talking about people who are reluctant and why that might be and what we need to do differently. 
I'm going to introduce uh, change model theory that's been around a long time. It's coming back into play just to maybe give you some insight into why do people not change when they know it's good for them? What is it in our brain that says, you know, I need to lose weight. I feel more comfortable. I need to stop smoking. I know it's bad for my health but then stop us taking it any further. And then I want to just talk about our role in changing patients' behaviours. So I'm hoping that this hour, which will whiz past, I want to leave some time for discussion because I think it's really important to hear what you're doing and how you could incorporate these things into your, into your practice. Okay. So um, when you look at um, public health, Really, public health has come from the background of we give advice. We're nurses, I'm a nurse, we give advice. That's what we do. We tell patients what's good for them, we help them understand. And really, um, advice giving theory, now it's researched, you won't be surprised. Um, we do put pros and cons into conversation. So we want to increase the patient's awareness, we want to give them a lot of advice. This is sort of how we feel good. As a nurse, I like to advise people, but do you know what? All the evidence is. You won't be surprised at this, that patients hear advice as critical and intrusive. So particularly relevant in your field, just pure advice giving will not change behavior. And we've been doing it for years. This was very much the model. This is what's got to change because advice giving, guess what? I'll do it for a week. I'll do it for two weeks. Maybe because I'm ashamed, maybe because I'm embarrassed, but I will not make long-term change. And patients hear advice <clears throat> as both critical and intrusive. And I just thought that's such, a, such an interesting point because it's not what we, we're taught. They really don't hear that advice. What can we do differently? Okay, so I went back <clears throat> and looked at when we've tried to actually change patients. And I looked at something that's been around since the 70s that I think you might find useful. So it's called... Prochaska's model of change and it's five steps and it was actually utilized to help people stop smoking. So in the 70s they thought why is it that we know smoking is not good for us but we're still having so many people smoke and this piece of research I think really helps explain some of the barriers you might be finding with your clients and, and really what it says is that you need to go through five stages. We are supportive through the five stages, but where I think you might be focusing with your clients is probably stage two, which is contemplation. So I'm assuming your patients might be aware of the problem, whether it's diet, medication compliance, but they're not making the behavior changes. And that's a really interesting point. Now, it's sometimes referred to as denial, and it's also linked to um, Alcoholics Anonymous. They'll also use this five-step change, but it's how do we get people up those steps? So that's the change model. We've had it since the 70s. How do we bring this into our clinical practice and help people move up the steps? So if we start at the contemplation step, this is where your patients know there's an issue. They weighed up the pros, they weighed up the cons, and they're about the same and you can't get them to move forward. So before we do that, I'm gonna get Sue to come on. Can I get you in the chat box to, to give us what reasons do your patients give you for not changing? So your patients, I'm, concerned, I'm putting them at step two. You've given them the advice, you've given them the input, but they're not changing. What reasons are they giving you? And let's try and dig into what is it they're saying around not changing diet, not changing compliance. Let's share those. So can you put them in the chat box and let Sue have a look? So we've got some early ones coming through straight away. So this is clearly, <laughs> oh, wow, we've got hundreds coming through. So um, what I like is people aren't ready. They have no motivation. Now, I've heard that a lot over the last year. Um, so I think that's a real key one for me. No motivation. Don't have the time. Um, that's again interesting this year because a lot of people have found now is the time to focus on themselves a bit more but that is a very very common thing for people to come up with they've got too busy a lifestyle too busy no time so a lot of that is coming in I like this one from Claire a fear of failure so actually some people are saying that they are afraid they're going to fail already yeah. um Audra said you know no time too stressed again I think the no being too stressed and, and the motivation in this last year is massive. I like this one. <laughs> Can't be bothered. 
Mm, okay. Don't want to uh, know what they need to do, but don't know how to do it. Uh, so again, lots on the same thing, depressed, no motivation, um, forgetting poor organization, just can't stop eating. That's honest. Yep. 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 So I like that. Yeah. I'm in a routine already. Somebody, a Beth here has put, you know, it's too painful as in blood glucose monitoring. So again, we're asking them to do something, but, but they, I've got a lot of theories about that, but yes, it's too painful. Um, they just want to enjoy their life, fear of trying. So lots and lots on the same scene. Uh, very, very good point here from Helen, who is a pediatrician, says that parents are in denial. Yeah. But again, I see an awful lot of yeah. this at the other end of the spectrum where people are looking after elderly relatives and want to control it or they have their own views about what their parent needs to do. But here we've got parents of children are in denial, don't want to take it in. Again, the challenges then with adolescence. So, yeah, currently lockdown is a big factor. A lot of people are saying, I like this, Jen, I say this as well. You know, now it's Christmas, then it'll be Easter, then there's birthdays. I swear a lot of my patients have 365 friends, all yeah. of which have a different birthday. Really rich data, but really <laughs> tying into, isn't it? Tying into yeah. that people are stuck on the contemplation step. Now, yes. doesn't it ring true with denial? So you can see alcoholics being stuck on the contem And also they say that people on the contemplation step will argue with you as the healthcare provider. They'll give you the reasons why their bad habits can't be stopped. And this is normal. This is ambivalence. So what we're gonna do is work with this. So what people are saying is rich evidence, but it's really normal human behavior because behavioral change on health takes two things. I have to give up something and I have to start something. So it's two changes because you're not just gonna stop you know, eating certain foods. You're also probably gonna exercise. You're gonna to have to think about medication management. And that's the bit that people struggle with. So all the information you've given is brilliant because it reassures me that people are on the contemplation step. A few people might still be on the pre-contemplation. I don't even believe I've got this, so I'm not going to do anything. But many people are in the ambivalent stage, which means they can be worked on, which means with conversation and with some steps that we're going to give you, you can get them to the point of thinking about taking them in first step. And the first step then moves into preparation. So what are we going to do if it's diet, if it's medication, if it's exercise? and then move to action. But there is actually, in a way that helps you to know that people being stuck on contemplation is normal in health change, same for smoking, alcohol, drugs, it's normal. Our job is to help move them forward with the sort of cognitive interventions we're going to be talking about. So don't feel disheartened that it's just your patients. It's normal around health change. We find it difficult. We find it difficult as humans. So even though we know it's good for us, it's still difficult. And I'm going to put a picture up, which some of you might recognize. So these are the chronic contemplators. These people may spend all their life in chronic contemplation. So there's some people that we will not be able to get up the next step. And they're the people who will be weighing up those pros and cons. Articulate. But they both have the same importance, equal importance. And then I'm going to put something up on the screen but the elephant won't be dragged or pulled. And you're going to say, what does that mean, Kath? I want to show you a video on behavior change that just ties in why, even when something's logical, even when something is completely logically good for us, sometimes we can't do it. So I'm going to see if Hope or Paige will put the next video on behavior change. Psychologists know that there are two systems in our brains, the rational system and the emotional system. Jonathan Haidt, who's a psychologist at NYU, came up with a great analogy for these two systems. He said, think of your brain as a human rider atop an elephant. The rider represents the rational system. That's the part of us that plans and problem solves. The rider might do some analyzing and decide, hey, I want to go that way. 
but it's the elephant representing the emotional system that provides the power for the journey. The rider can try to lead the elephant or drag the elephant, but if these two ever disagree, who would you bet on? The elephant has a six ton weight advantage, and it's exactly that power imbalance that makes adopting new behaviors very hard. If you want this duo to head a new direction, you also need to think about the path, which represents the external environment. This duo is more likely to complete a journey if you can shorten the distance and remove any obstacles in their way. So bottom line, if you want to lead change, you've got to do three things. Give direction to the rider, knowledge of how to get to the destination. You've got to motivate the elephant, which means tapping into emotion. And finally, you need to shape the path to allow for easy progress. That's how change happens. Here we are. So really just to get into our minds that it's hearts and minds that win. So logic, we all know when, you know, we all know about salt, we all know about smoking, we know this stuff. We do know about health education. What is it that's stopping us to take the next step? And that was just a brilliant little illustration, I think, that you've got to engage emotions. You've got to engage patients' emotions with questions, with motivational interviewing, to understand what will make them take that next step. So they know the stuff, they know it's good for them, but why can't they get the elephant to move? So it's something about buying into hearts and minds. And I just think that's a really interesting way of, of showing why we sometimes get stuck. Um, and this is really working with health change. Now, some of us, you might recall, if you've done the first two workshops with me, you have a really important role in coming alongside the patient. Now, Sue always emphasizes this. This rapport building with the patient is central more so than advice giving, more so than giving thanks, this rapport to come alongside the patient. And we do that with things like reflective and open questions. So rather than advice giving, it's understanding what their motivators are. What do they want? Being able to hear change talk, so I'm gonna explain what that is, but that's when they are actually starting to think about moving to the next step. And then creating a plan with the patient's consent, because a plan is really useful. If something's, you know, let's think of CQC, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. Plans can be really useful with patient's consent, but also that uh, role we have in encouraging and supporting. So we are key in, if you like, holding up the map to the elephant and the rider. This is where life can be if we make these changes now. So using emotion rather than just logic, because we're logical creatures, actually emotion, helping people get that motivation by talking through, let's understand what's important for you. What do you need to change? What would a good day look like? So using some of that language that we've talked about before. So um, let me just go on to, we're gonna talk about motivational interviewing. And I've got a couple of videos to show you. So I think it's nice for you to be able to see what we're actually talking about. And we have covered this in the earlier sessions, but it's really bringing to life empathy. So you're working with a patient who's really struggling to lose weight. You know it's affecting their diabetes or their diet is, is in under control. Really looking at how you can express empathy in your active listing, how you can be reflective. Also, really listening for that discrepancy and, and hearing the patients. They will be in denial. They can be frustrating. We can be triggered. And by trigger, it means sometimes there's a paternal or a maternal element in us. And I can feel that sometimes when somebody's giving me a whole load of nonsense and I know that this path will be better for them. Watch that, that we don't voice that triggering. We don't voice how frustrated you are, how irritated you are. Really important to avoid argument and got a little video that shows that even in the, under provocation with your patients, they'll be arguing with me, you know, avoid arguing because that's a stuck person who needs to get to the next step with help. So if we see ourselves as skilled helpers and working on the emotional part of the brain rather than logical, because everybody knows, if someone says, I don't need anything, I don't know how I've put on this weight, 
actually that's not true but let's work with the emotion around what do you think might have affected you this week let's talk about that let's get that conversation going and adjust to client resistance so one of the things that they say is we will have client resistance and ambivalence but it's rolling with it and thinking okay uh so you didn't do as well this week on your medication adherence but you've lost a couple of pounds that's great picking up the positives all the evidence is that patients will not come to appointments if they fear they're going to be told off. And, you know, this is, this is crazy, isn't it? This is our health. But yet research shows that if they feel that there will be any sort of um, condemnation about not doing what they should have done or not achieving it, they will rather stay at home. And, it, and, and it's, it's um, across, it's international. I was looking at this in Mexico and people were saying, I'm not going to go and see my nurse this week because I haven't followed progress. So this isn't just us. It's something about really struggling with that change and struggling with people who might confront me on it. And then you want to bring optimism in. Optimism is so important in a journey, isn't it? So I've lost five pounds, but I didn't lose as much as I could this week. Optimism, looking forward, praise, positivity, change is hard change is hard and it's so easy isn't it to slip back to you know binge watching netflix and eating what you want change is hard we know that so imagine people with a lifelong condition knowing it so really just want to get you to think about we're going to talk about motivational interviewing your attitude towards patients which is engaging encouraging and as sue always says find their motivation anything you want to add at that point sue uh, I, th I think that's such a good point because as healthcare professionals dealing with this group of people, what is really challenging is the evidence that we have now about the benefits of achieving control, whatever that looks like, that glucose, lipids, blood pressure, all of those things, their weight management, et cetera, is great, but we can't do it for them. And the temptation is to try and push, push. We have less and less time to see people. And yet we still have to try and get this message across. And it is so, so hard. And so what I often hear people default to is trying to shock somebody out of where they are by by using that veiled, you know, if, if things don't improve, the next thing that will happen is, you know, you'll have a heart attack, your foot will fall off. When I started in diabetes, I used to sit with consultants who would sit down on the end of a bed and say to patients, you have to control this or else. Um, and, and the challenge in, in care now is getting the message across that we need people to improve, but without threatening, because we can't do this for them. And it's the hardest, hardest thing ever to try and find that motivator in somebody. Yeah, great. I'm gonna see if I can help around that, just to try and give you some principles. And I've got some questions coming up that would be great ones to start. And as Sue said, how we speak to people, so the tone, as well as the words, as well as what we say, it's just as important as what we say. And I remember as well in my nurse training, people would be told, you know, if you don't stop eating, your heart will just stop one day. We used to use threats for people, you know, and we used to give them lots of advice and almost lecture because that was how we were taught. But research tells us patients will not, yes, nurse, yes, doctor, and go away and not change at all. So not only does it not work, it's also likely to disincentivize people. And even though we're frustrated, trying to find a motivational technique where you see that step as the thing you want to move them towards. So you're trying to move them towards action. And whether you use an action plan that they've agreed to, to look at all sorts of tiny changes that lead to something significant. That's the way to do it. And understand that there will be ambivalence. That's normal. But to keep moving forward. One of the things that Sue's often mentioned is the person who's got the problem is the best person who's got the key to solving it. So finding out from people in your conversation what, what needs to adjust in their life that they can work on their weight plan or their management. Now, I know that people keep saying time. We know that that's just an excuse because there is always time to do this. So again, 
push past that and say, okay, you know, as we do, so you've got a really, really busy day, when might be a good part to try this. So work with them on helping find a solution because people get blocked in that, I can't do this, it's too hard, I'm too busy, I'm too, and we're gonna see this in a video, the I'm too busy used, and it would have been very tempting to push back and saying, you know, are you too busy for your health? That's not gonna work. Work with people on what could they adjust in their schedule? How could they fit in their exercise, their diet management? These are techniques that will see us as a coming alongside the person, helping. And also solutions people find, they're the most effective. So helping them say, what would you do? Now, some, sometimes when I get really stuck with someone, this is a technique I use, if someone will not move out of a situation. Sometimes people find it easier to think of giving advice to a friend. So sometimes if someone's really stuck and I think they're doing something destructive, I'll say, what advice would you give a friend? And people will say, oh, well, I tell them to stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing the other. Just giving people um, that freedom cognitively. And the other thing is, is rather than say, tell me one thing that you'll do differently, it's hard to find that people go blank, cognitively say, what are one or two things? What are one or two things that you might do? It gives you just a bit of choice. So again, just the way we frame things, what one or two things will you do? Freeze people up. One thing I feel put on the spot, I don't know what to say with the nurse, I might get it wrong. What one or two things could you try is a really helpful linguistic tip that allows people to think, oh, I might think of it differently and ask a friend. People often can give the best advice to friends and then you sit back and they say, oh, that's what I tell my friend. I don't I take it myself. And you allow that self-reflection because people will often have that, what I call the aha moment. Oh, I know what I could tell my friend. I get it. I get what they're trying to tell me. Okay. So I've got some questions which people use these as almost openers to take this conversation. Remember, we're moving people up the pre-contemplation step. And again, it's putting us in that helper role. How can I help you with? Help me understand. How would you like things to be different? These are open questions that are not threatening, but you're wanting the person to explore for themselves what's blocking my motivation to get into the next step when you'll start to see things. And also, what are good things about, what are less good about, and what would you like to be doing? So you're opening people's thought to, Okay, so if I did lose some weight, what would I like to do? I could go and pick my kids up from school. I could run around more easily. Get them to start to think about the motivating factors that you can then put into a plan. So if somebody says, oh, one of my aims is, you know, if I lost 20 pounds, I could probably walk the kids to school. Great, that's going in the plan. That's the aim that you're aiming for. That's, that's something that someone's identified themselves. It's a goal they want. You're much more likely to get them to move towards an emotional goal that lose 20 pounds for your health. Lose 20 pounds so you can run around with the kids or walk them to school. There's a difference. One is set by us, one is set by them. So again, it's thinking the patient has to help with the goal, the motivation. You help shape it. You help frame it through these helpful conversations. And then listening for change talk. Now, that is use it a lot um, because I do a lot of work around mediation you're listening for that aha moment so people might start to say and when I lost that 20 pounds yeah yeah I could see then it would be easy for me to do so you're listening for people talking about when I if I I could and that will be a real shift away from no no can't do it change talk is a really important sign because it means people are actually thinking and seeing I could be on the next step. So we've got some examples coming up, but it's, it's getting, when you hear people actually start to tell you about what I could do, how I could do it, if I did do it, that's great. And you wanna capture that. So they're not just passively listening, they're contributing to the conversation and they're telling you, they're telling you, they might even not realize it, Change talk is alerting you, this person's thinking about moving forward. So really important in the conversation, when you hear change talk, if I did this, 
if I changed my diary, if I looked at my diet, you're hearing them move Oh, slightly up on the pre-contemplative into action. So you want to listen for change talk. And then after that comes confirmation where people say, when I've lost that. So, but listen for change talk, because that gives you hope. Yes, 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 there's some movement going, but also it's great that you can get that down. Now, I think it's the time to, we've got two, what I hope you find interesting videos. So they're dealing with difficult people because it is so frustrating when you are having the same conversations and you're not seeing progress. Frustrating for you as a clinician, frustrating for patients. But we've got two videos. The first one is somebody who isn't using motivational interviewing, so isn't using um, open questions, reflective questions. I can understand this person's got triggered and by that I think their irritation is showing. So it'd be great for you to watch that one. And then straight after that, we're going to have a second one. We've got somebody using motivational interviewing. And after that, I really want to see, have a good conversation about whether it's helpful, what bits you could use, what bits you can take away. Rolling with resistance is an important skill that can help you deal with difficult situations. We're going to look at some scenarios that highlight the sort of resistance you may come across and the different methods you can use to handle it better. But to start with, let's look at an example where a conversation with a resistant parent goes wrong. I've, uh, I've got you a drink, babe, just like I promised. You can have it afterwards. Excuse me, I, I'd rather you didn't give that to Taylor. Fizzy drinks are full of sugar and they're really bad for her teeth. Yeah, well, it's just a little treat that I promised her that she could have if she was good and came here today, so that's why I'm going to give it to her. Well, I'm sure you know that's not the best thing for her. It's full of sugar, and that's probably the reason why Taylor's teeth are full of decay. You shouldn't be giving her that kind of stuff to drink. You should be giving her water, especially when it, it looks as if Taylor's not been cleaning her teeth properly. They really are in a very, very poor condition. They're full of holes. You are? Are you blaming me for that? You're saying her teeth are in bad condition because I don't look after them properly. We're probably going to have to take one or two teeth out. In the meantime, I need a clear idea of Taylor's overall diet and toothbrushing. Try to get to the bottom of why her teeth are in such a bad way. I'd like you to fill in a diary of Taylor's diet over three days, with one of those days over a weekend. Who are you? The teeth police checking up on me. I have told you, I don't give her any fizzy drinks or sugary snacks. It shouldn't be me that's having to fill in this diary. She spends most of her weekends with her dad. He, he's the one that doesn't look at what she eats or drinks. Well, she's getting the holes from somewhere. Holes just don't appear for no reason. I need to have a clear picture of her diet and her toothbrushing. You are her mum. I think you are the one responsible for sorting this out. Uh, I am sorting it out. That's why I'm here, isn't it? Well, you know what? This has been an absolute waste of my time. You might be thinking that was a bit extreme. Well, it probably was. But it was a good example of how not to deal with resistance. The dentist wasn't very empathetic at all, and this made the resistance worse. There may be many reasons why a parent resists the advice you give them, and we know how difficult it can be to change unhealthy behaviours. Sometimes people aren't quite ready to change, and it's important to support them to the next step. Okay, we're going to have the next video up. I don't think it's the case that people are either not motivated or motivated. And in fact, motivational interviewing was born from conversations with very, very difficult people who were classified as not at all motivated to change and very resistant to treatment.
Well, Mr. Smith, that's your medication sorted out. Good. Blood pressure's a little on the high side. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if I could raise the subject of your weight. What? I wondered if we could spend just a couple of minutes talking about your weight. You are joking, aren't you? I mean, look, I've made time in my day to come here. Yeah. I'm kept in your waiting room for 45 yeah. minutes. Yeah. It's not acceptable. You know, yeah. if I make an appointment with yeah. a client for 10, I expect them to start yeah. at 10, not quarter to 11. Right, and you, so you're busy enough. And yeah, it, I've got it, other things to do. I've got yeah. accounts to do. I've got clients yeah. to coming in. Yeah. You know. yeah, and it wasn't necessarily easy for you to, to make the time to come down and you had to wait in the waiting room and now I raise the subject of weight. Yeah, I mean, okay, fair enough. Um, I've got to have my blood pressure yeah. medication change, yeah. but I yeah. really haven't got time to talk about right. my weight. I mean, you know, I'm aware of my weight, I'm aware right. of the problems, and I'm also aware of the solutions. Right. Um, so I don't really need a discussion. It's, it's just I've got... Too much to do at the moment, you know. Right, and so it, it's 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 been a bit of a rush for you coming in. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm sorry about the wait in the waiting well, room. Well, it's bad. Yeah. It's bad form, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's and and that that's not easy for you because you you'd like to go really soon, and here I am asking you to spend just a couple of minutes with me. Yeah, but basically I've got things to do. I've got to yeah. get back to the office. I've got yeah. a pile of work that yeah. I've got to deal with. Yeah, and every time every moment out of my day yeah. means I have to work in the evening or yeah. weekends. It you know. counts. Or well, when yeah. you're self-employed, you haven't got a choice. Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. It's up to you. Just a couple of minutes. Well, I'm here now, so yeah, okay, if it's a couple of minutes, yeah? I promise. Okay, because I, I really must get on. I want, I, I want to simply ask you how you feel about it. About what? what losing weight? Well, obviously, I, I want to. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, who doesn't? I mean, I'm aware that I'm over my... Uh, balance weight but and yeah. I know that it's causing problems I mean obviously I get out of breath if I have to do something a bit hurry and I realize that I'm on this blood pressure right um, and, and maybe that's probably contributing to it right so you can see the links between your weight and your health and you'd like things to be yeah a bit I mean um, there are other things but I mean yeah the weight is a, is a, is a something I would like to get hold of you right. get on get on the handle on, you know. you'd like to if you could yeah, I mean, I know um, the, the theories of um, a bit of exercise on a regular basis, um, a balanced diet, um, but unfortunately, because of my lifestyle, because of being self-employed as an accountant, it's finding the time uh, to exercise, but also finding the time to sort of think, okay, I'm going to go shopping for this, that, and the other, and yeah. I'm going to prepare a meal. Yeah. With me, it's very often... Ready meals and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. food on the run, you know, okay, yeah. grazing. Let me see if I can summarise what you've said, um, and then we'll see what next. Um, you lead a busy life. Yeah. Um, you run a business and you've got a lot to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're aware of the, of the links between your health and your weight, and you are concerned to some extent about that, and ideally it sounds like you'd like to do something about it. It's just that your life is busy and rushed, and you tend to use convenience foods in order to get the work done. Yeah, I mean, I, to a certain extent, because of my lifestyle, food is just fuel. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, yeah. because I'm juggling all these balls and I don't want to drop any. I get it, yeah. I get it. And so if you could fit it in, you would like things to be different, but that's not so easy. No. Okay. Can I suggest that you come back and see me in a couple of weeks' time just to chat about this? Um, okay, I'm up for that, but it's going to be the same problem of A, finding time, right. and B, if I make an appointment, right. Right. I don't expect to be kept waiting for half an hour exactly. or whatever, because it's... Exactly. I'll tell you what might be a nice solution is if you come down first appointment, and I give you an appointment at 8.30, That'd um, be good. then there'll be absolutely no waiting. And the purpose of that, of that visit will be to have a look at how you really feel about how you could move forward and somehow fit in a more healthier lifestyle into the busy work life that you've got. I'll maybe have a look at my schedules, see whether yeah. anything can be arranged or I can pass something yeah. on to some, and, and so, that I, so it's not a wasted interview. Yeah. So I can come here and say, okay, I've looked at my schedules, I've looked at things. Good. Whatever. Good. And see if you can fix it up and also give some thought to what we've talked about. Yeah, of course. Good stuff. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Sorry, Sorry I went off a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A few well-chosen words 
a very thoughtful question can be worth more than many mouthfuls of busy talk. Okay, so Sue, so, um, I'm going to show my next slide. I'm really interested to get some feedback from people on those two videos. Um, what worked and what didn't work in the videos, how was empathy demonstrated, really what you thought, because that was a live showing of some motivational interviewing. And I just wondered how people found it. The, the doctor doing the interviewing agreed with a very angry patient, was using reflective practice, was brilliant in using active listening, and was trying to get somebody who was very resistive. And I was concerned about that man. Not only was he so overweight, I thought he had a pressure sore as well. So I was really worried about his health. But he turned that situation into one where he was trying to build rapport, motivation. This was going to be a long journey to get somebody up the next step. Really interested to see. So if you had any thoughts and then what people thought about the two videos, what was the learning, if anything, from those two videos? OK, so please, please do keep sending me through thoughts either in the QA box or the chat box. I'm becoming very good at keeping an eye on all of this. Um, so, uh, so Julie's commented one was listening and one was preaching, um, but but you can still, I mean, get, going back to the dentist, that's what I was meaning about, you know, that the, the frustration when you've got a short time and, and as healthcare professionals, we can see that somebody is really running into danger and, and the temptation is so easy to try and solve it and be, be very, very quick. Um, yeah, a few people coming in here, the use of paraphrasing, summarizing. I loved what the, the doctor was doing in the end because he actually, he didn't say anything, did he? he? He was almost just acknowledging the person's frustration at being held late and, and everything else. And, and going right back to our first session about active listening, he was really just sowing the seed and the person then just fills the gap and just starts to speak. Um, uh, Susan's come in, really great videos, hope she can share them with her team. And, and I do think, because we've had a few comments coming through, yes, you will get the video links afterwards. I appreciate a few of you have been challenged with the, the sound quality during this session. So again, when, when you get this sent to you on demand afterwards, then um, certainly you, you, you will get those and you will get to use them. Tone of voice, tone of voice was very calm asking permissions in the second one. Um, I was really looking forward to the dentist doing it in the motivational interviewing way, but then it was a completely different scenario. But, it, but I, I think the two videos that you've picked absolutely pick up the two contrasts and just sometimes just showing one done badly and one then done well, it's, it can be a bit obvious. Whereas I, I just think um, both of them picked up really, really challenging challenging scenarios that we face all the time and no two patients are the same are they um because i've i've got this one feeling as well that you know as people our learning styles are so very different and sometimes i see myself as a bit of a a football manager depending on who it is that I'm dealing with and once I've built up a relationship with somebody that I'm working with I know the people who can be nudged along um, those who need an arm around them those that actually will take uh, a quite frank discussion but those in whom that would be completely destroying so that for us is about not trying to treat everybody the same. Everybody is different, but we have to take the time to build that relationship and understand their learning style and, and understand them as a person. I mean, I thought that the, the gentleman who was so overweight, he was brilliant with his lack of awareness. He knew, he knew he was overweight. He knew he was probably uncomfortable even sitting on that chair, but he was well defended. And also sometimes when our patients are angry with us, that's a really good denial mechanism. So, you know, having to wait was the reason he was going to not listen to advice. And it's very triggering for us as healthcare workers who are very busy when someone says, I had to wait out there. It would have been really easy to snap back and say, well, yes, yeah, yes, it's the NHS. And you've lost them. Yeah. And the, I love the way they went into it. Yes. So that was really difficult for you. Yep. Didn't agree with it and, and say, you know, um, what do you expect? But was really 
great at empathizing because that is a defense. That's a defense. Yeah. And if we get tripped up on that, so yeah. it triggered me feeling furious for something somebody said, I've got to let that go. I think in the same way, actually, the dentist fell into that trap, didn't he? Because he was showing all the defensive behavior and becoming more and more because, you know, I, I'm guessing he felt he didn't like what he was hearing from the young mum. And somebody, Susan, here has commented that, you know, she'll probably never return. And and I guess we, we get that with patients all the time, don't we? If, if people feel that they're just coming, as you said, to start with, you know, if they feel they're just going to be told off, those are the people who just don't come back so yeah really really interesting i wanted to pick such different videos they both touched a little bit on diabetic topics around diet but particularly the second one the difficult patients but also i thought for people who are working with parents yeah and it would be so easy i could feel some empathy for the dentist i don't think he handled it well but he was triggered by the waving the sugar in his face is not a thing you really want to do in the dentist so i feel that that was quite triggering behavior and our yeah. patients sometimes do that they draw a response and it puts us into paternal mode and we go into you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that and you know what they switch off yeah. so it's really if you find yourself turning into parent mode you watch think take a step back this is a distraction because once i'm in parent mode they get, she was even more childish then. What are you? Are you the teeth police? So she went right back to being a child herself. So we have to be quite self-aware when we're having these conversations that if you feel suddenly very angry, you may be triggered. Step out of that because you're not a parent in this role. You're coming alongside the person to work with them. And even taking a breath can just... And, and that's where, you know, when we did this this first one of these three, it's about active listening. And I feel if, if I'm beginning to rise inside, it, it's OK, deep breath and listen, because that gap, somebody always fills it. And if you're not filling it, they have to. And sometimes even if somebody comes on to you quite aggressively, they can almost talk themselves around if you don't respond. Yeah. And there was even an apology out of that mm -hmm. guy in the second one. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I came across aggressively. He yeah. recognised his behaviour. And that's defensiveness, fear, anxiety, all those things sometimes modelled as, you know, denial. Yeah, nothing wrong with me. I don't need help. Actually, he's, he's dying in front of that doctor. He's looking so unhealthy. Um, it, it's about us. And I think the doctor had a lovely manner of taking it all and then saying so we'll meet again and we'll talk about this so he was really determined to get him to that next step i mean there's a comment that's just come in here which i think is really important to recognize as well from kishore which is will this help with neglectful carers or parents um, and, and i think absolutely our role is also to find those situations um, and and I sadly lately have had to do quite a few safeguarding incidents so again that's our professional side the way we handle it in that situation might be the same but if that is triggering to us a safeguarding issue then we need to explore that too and maybe in that situation is not right I tend to come away gather my evidence, think about the situation. Um, and, and if there really is a safeguarding issue that we have to deal with it, because what we equally can't do is sit back and become just complacent and that we go along with allowing somebody to keep giving us reasons for this behavior, which is going to run them into problems. Um, and, and it's that fine balance between, like you say, nudging them to the next level. Um, or just sit back saying, oh, well, they don't want to change. So I've had the discussion that equally is not good care. Yeah, it's a fine balance because sadly, mm. Sue, some people will die staying in the pre-contemplative stage. Yep. And, and that will be fewer, fewer than, than actually make the step. But it's, it's terribly sad. They'll have spent so long wondering about, should I do this? They will die of their condition unmanaged because they haven't taken that next step. But for many people with sort of almost a ladder being built and us alongside nudging them they can start to think about what changes could I make so for those videos I'm really pleased that I think I hope people found them interesting 
I just wanted to look at the second point, which is how is empathy demonstrated? Because I thought it was demonstrated in so many ways from body language, eye contact. And did you notice as the man got angrier, the health professional got quieter? So often patients feed off us. So if we get upset, angry, sharp, being snappy, they mimic it. And I know if I'm ever dealing with somebody who's aggressive, if I talk more slowly and quietly, that also brings them down because they mirror what they're seeing. And I thought that it was quite a threatening situation. You've got a very big man in front of you, leaning forward, really angry about, and a lot of people would have just said, okay, you know, you know, thank you, go, let him go. The doctor kept him in the room and kept talking to him. And that's a real skill to not put ourselves in danger, but to think about your own body language. It's easy to become infected, contagion of anger. When a patient's angry, we can get angry as well, to actually stay very calm. And I think a trick to do that is to paraphrase everything the person said. So can I just check this out with you? You come in late, if you had to wait, it's very difficult for you, you're really busy. And that calmed the person because they're mm. feeling heard. Yeah, I, I think I, I totally agree. I, I think again with paraphrasing, the way he did it was very, because he kept saying the same thing back to him. Um, because sometimes I have heard people paraphrase when it, it can come across as almost being a bit patronizing um, and, and or that you're throwing the situation back to somebody in quite an accusing way. So again, uh, the whole run of our language has to be so careful um, and calm when we are passing it back and literally paraphrasing and, and not being accusatory to somebody. And then we've already answered this one, but which patient relative is likely to return? Well, I think <laughs> we know that one. I think that mum was out the door, angry, off to fizzy drink land, and we'd lost, we'd lost somebody to potentially work alongside us with that child because she felt shamed. And she immediately passed it on to the ex and it was never going to go anywhere. That, <laughs> that one was probably irretrievable. When you got to that level. Yeah. Yeah. Not. Claire's just come up with a comment here. And this is, you know, what I'm, I'm trying to say with, with healthcare professionals at the moment. This is the challenge. So building relationships with patients takes time. Yes, it absolutely does. I appreciate that. And we are seeing people for a shorter and shorter time over a longer and longer period. So it's even harder to build that relationship. Um, but to, to sit and watch people who don't go through the contemplation stage is challenging when you know your waiting lists are longer yeah. um, uh, for having patients who don't appear to move on. And I think the hardest thing to do there, and this is when, again, I advise people, this is where we absolutely need to, to make sure that we have had that conversation but more importantly, if you feel this person isn't moving on anywhere, that we record yeah. that conversation because sadly, these people suddenly become motivated after an acute event, maybe a heart attack or a stroke, or we've seen it so many times, but we, it is frustrating as a healthcare professional. And I totally get that but we cannot force change on everybody. Um, so the, the, the next thing that we have to do is record that we've had the conversation and the way that we've had the conversation. Julie's come up as well. The real challenge for us now is that this is being done remotely. Mm. Um, and, I, and I know you and I have talked about remote consultations and the challenge is there. Um, I certainly think, you know, we have got this to face for the whole of this year. Mm. And then we'll be picking up, picking up with a group of patients who have probably had a year, 18 months at least without this support. So it will be even harder to get some of those people moving again. Um, so, yeah, we don't have all the answers, but, you know, we, we appreciate that there is a huge, huge challenge. But people will, will move, sadly. It may be in their own time frame and not when we would want them to make that next step. So you have to record that you've had that conversation. 
you know, you're a limited resource. You can do what you can do. I always think of the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of people I can probably help, but there'll be 20% I can't. And anything I'm doing, whether it's whether it's in the mediation, whether it's in dealing with conflict, whether it's health development, probably I've got, a, I think, about 80% of people have got some insight and will move to some extent. 20% of people I can't move and I can't change. And it's having the wisdom to know I have to step yeah. away. Do you know that has been the most brilliant comment come in from Sarah. Sarah, thank you so much for this. She says, I think the frustration for me is that I feel diabetes is the real work and talking is just decoration. But I've come to understand that talking is the real work and diabetes just a symptom of talking not working or working. I, I think that absolutely summarizes what we've been trying to say over three weeks. So thank you. Um, another challenge is assessing patients' capacity to make these decisions. Again, absolutely. And, you know, if that person doesn't have capacity, what are we doing to protect them? If then, you know, we're having to deal with relatives constantly, constantly on the lookout. For me, it's keeping that person at the centre and is the care being given the best, safest, safest care that we can give? Uh, courage to change what I can change, serenity to accept that that I can't, um, and wisdom to know the difference. Yes, well done, Damien. Excellent, excellent quote. We need to know that difference, but also courage for us to try something different. Keep trying. Yeah. And do you know, sometimes a different healthcare professional can just open a door that you can. I've worked with people for years, and then they see a colleague of mine and things change. And, and again, we have to accept that too. Sometimes just speaking to somebody else within our team may just, may just open a door that we couldn't. No, I always recommend that. Sometimes if you feel stuck with a patient, they might feel stuck with you. <laughs> brave to move on. Now, so going back to that dentist, they need to change providers because I don't think that young mum will feel that rapport. So rather than him battling on and being clunky, I would let her work with someone else. So again, sometimes there's no shame in saying, I can't take this any further. For whatever reason, it's not working. And do you know what? Sometimes the patient will be relieved. <laughs> so there isn't any harm in recognizing a, sometimes a fresh face, a stop. So sometimes in conflict, a pause, we'll have a break. People will come back in the room. Actually, I feel differently. They can have a break with a different provider actually yeah. I feel differently a pause yeah be a good thing it doesn't yeah. mean we failed it's another tool in the toolbox it is do you I'm know not... what kath kath we have yet again talked our hour away and so i appreciate some of the people are having to go but there have been such good comments again um somebody is saying oh, loads of people thanking us for this so thank you thank you for staying for the hour um but again there are there are other real challenges here um that i'm sure we could do this repeat this many times over thank, thank you everybody for listening and staying thank you kath Thanks. Thank you both Kath and Sue so much. It has been such a fantastic series of skills webinars. So I really, really appreciate you being involved in them and giving up your time to, to talk through these really important issues. I'd like to just thank Abbott again as well for sponsoring the webinars. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.